nonetheless, for complicated reasons I'm not going to go into, that allows a cell to be a little bit resistant to malaria. You can do the same thing with the other, the beta chain of hemoglobin. Throw it out, and that helps a little bit against malaria. You can break some other genes, something called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, G6PD. If that is deleted, it turns out that helps in the fight against malaria. We're not building anything here, though. We're breaking things. We're throwing things out. Another one, band 3 protein, Duffy antigen. Again, throwing them out or turning them off uh, helps in the fight against malaria. So here's the picture I want to leave with you of Darwinian evolution at work. And this is another picture I grabbed off the web. This is a picture of soldiers, I think it's in Colombia in South America. And it turns out the army had gotten wind of where uh, a camp was, was, which was being used by uh, folks involved in the drug trade, and they were on their way to raid the camp, and the folks in the drug trade got wind of it, and they blew up the bridge. Now that's a beneficial change if you are the folks involved in the drug trade. It stops them from invading your camp. Turns out like many of the mutations involved in malaria resistance are exactly like that at the molecular level. The malarial parasite has to grab onto machinery of the red blood cell to work its way in. One way to stop the malarial parasite is to blow up that molecular bridge, throw it out, and that's what human cells do. But again, we are not making machinery, we're destroying it. Blowing up a bridge might be useful in some circumstances, but it does not tell you how you build a bridge. <coughs> And this is just uh, to make the point, this is a quote from a paper on, uh, on malaria and human genetic changes in regard to it, that what I've been telling you about are the best examples of natural selection that we know about in humans. This is what we best know that Darwinian evolution does. So again, much Darwinian evolution proceeds by breaking old genes. Uh, another important point that I'll hit on here is that very few of possible accessible mutations help. There was a handful of mutations on that slide, but there are trillions of changes one could make to the human genome by deleting or substituting or inserting uh, different amino acids or nucleotides. So very few changes help, and the ones that do uh, degrade the human genome. Okay, well that's one example. Um, but uh, do we have any other examples? And, and the answer is yes. And uh, one of the best is, is outside the, the example of malaria. I'll get back to that. Uh, but it's based on work done by a, a man named Richard Lems Lensky at Michigan State, who's done some excellent work on uh, bacteria in the past decade and a half. And he's just been elected to the National Academy of Sciences for this work. Uh, the problem with humans is that they breed too slowly. 10 years, 20 years, uh, generation time. But bacteria, like E. coli, Escherichia coli, which lives in, in guts, can be cultured in the laboratory. And you can grow it with a generation time of half a dozen generations a day. And you can grow it in enormous numbers. And Richard Lenski has done exactly that. And he grew E. coli uh, with a, a total population perhaps 100 times the number of humans that have ever lived that have had malaria. Uh, and he's gone through about 100 times the number of generations, 30,000 generations, uh, then uh, have experienced uh, malaria in, in recent years uh, in humans. So he has, he has uh, gone from uh, orders of magnitude more generations with a whole lot more organisms. Uh, simply to see what evolution would do uh, with these bacteria. And it turns out it does pretty much the same thing as we saw in the case of malaria in humans. Uh, in recent years, he's published his findings that <coughs> genes for something called, uh, something that makes a, a substance called ribose were deleted, destroyed, thrown out by the E. coli genome. Uh, that, uh, that, um, Mutations in something, where is it? And another opera, or another gene for, that makes a sugar called maltose, they were also thrown out or destroyed 
uh, <clears throat> he's uh, recently published work uh, showing a number of other genes and you see all these little arrows that's where mutations occur repeatedly uh, in the same gene in different kind of flasks laboratory flasks that he's growing showing that breaking these g different genes has been beneficial to the organism so uh, without going into much detail the general results he gets with many more organisms and much longer generations uh, is what we see in in sickle cell so we are not here building models we're not hypothesizing what uh, Darwinian evolution should do this is an observation of what it does do and what we see uh, what a people have, oh, what people have seen before is that of those mutations that affect an or organism about 99 percent are detrimental and Darwinists have always said yeah yeah but the one percent that are beneficial they're the ones that are they're most important the, the ones that are detrimental you never hear from again but what we see from sickle cell and the E. coli work is that even the beneficial mutations, the great majority, all of the ones that we see, break genes or degrade function. And here's another little cartoon that I would like to, to leave to impress in your head. This is what random mutation does. It's a bull in a china shop. The genome, many of the proteins, the molecular machinery and cells is very finely tuned and random mutation is, uh, is unlike, unlikely to help, help it. And again, this is not an argument, it's an observation. So let's get back to malaria. And here's the uh, mosquito, Anopheles uh, gambiae, which transmits uh, the worst form of malaria in Africa. And uh, here's an electron micrograph of malarial parasites and single-celled malarial parasites eating red blood cells and bursting out from them. The nice thing about malaria, at least from one point of view, uh, is that, you know, we, I said that the E. coli work had orders of magnitude, hundreds of times more organisms than, um, than uh, uh, were involved in, in the human studies. Well, m the malarial parasite has even greater numbers, you know, many, many more uh, numbers of parasites uh, exist in the world than have existed in, say, Richard Lenski's experiments. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you all remember your exponential notation, or your scientific notation, uh, but here's a, a little, uh, a little uh, um, table to show that you can represent big numbers just by putting a 10 and a superscript beside it uh, that uh, shows that numbers increase very rapidly. For example, 10 to the 6th is a million, 10 to the 12th is a trillion, and so on. Well, how many malarial parasites are there in the world? <clears throat> well, it turns out that a person who's sick with malaria, when the malaria reproduces and grows inside him, uh, can have on the order of 10 to the 12th a trillion, a trillion cells, a trillion malarial cells in one person. And every year, hundreds of millions of people get sick with malaria. So if you work out the math, it turns out that there are on the order of 10 to the 20th malarial cells produced each year uh, in the world. Now uh, to put this in perspective, 10 to, the, 10 to the 20th, if Richard Lenski continued his experiments, he would have to continue his experiments for another billion years to get the same number of, mal of cells that occur each year in, in malaria. So the point is that with a huge number of cells, random mutation has that many more opportunities to come up with some lucky change, some fortunate change in an organism for which natural selection can grab onto and run with it. And <clears throat> it turns out that uh, the malarial parasite has wanted to deal with uh, some drugs that, that humans have invented uh, in the past uh, 50 years or so uh, and find ways around them. Uh, the drug, the most effective drug against malaria for a long time, for decades, was something called chloroquine. Here's the molecular structure of it. And it kills the malarial parasite. Uh, but unfortunately, after a decade or two of using chloroquine, the malarial parasite has become resistant to it. 
And again, Darwinists have pointed to this as a good example of what Darwinian evolution can do. And again, they're right. But again, just like sickle cell, it points much more strongly to the limits of random mutation than to, the, uh, than to its, its uh, capacities. Only uh, four, about four or five years ago, the mutations that conferred resistance to chloroquine in malaria were tracked down after a lot of hard work by a number of laboratories. Uh, and uh, oh, here's the um, here's a story from the uh, the journal Science from uh, a few years ago, uh, emphasizing that chloroquine is is now really no longer effective because of this uh, acquisition of resistance by malaria. And it turns out that it, uh, that just like sickle cell disease involved specific changes in particular amino acids in a particular protein, hemoglobin, resistance to chloroquine does too. A, a, uh, a protein called PFCRT, which stands for Plasmodium falciparum chloroquine resistance trait, it's just a protein that is changed, had a couple amino acids changed. Any, and different, different proteins from different parts of the world turned out had anywhere from four to eight changes. But two changes occurred in almost all of the resistance strain, here and here. Um, and it turns out that having to change two or more than one vastly increases the difficulty of random mutation finding that combination for the same reason that I don't know if anybody here plays Powerball. I'm sure you're all upstanding citizens don't do that. Uh, I do it all the time. Uh, and uh, as you know, if you have to match one number, it's easy. If you have to match two, it goes up exponentially. If you have to match three, it goes up ex exponentially with the number that you have to match. The same way with changes in DNA. If you have to match more than one, matching one is really not a problem for Darwinian processes. Matching two it starts really breathing hard. It, it, it has a tough time. For example, here's the frequency of development of resistance to two different antibiotics by the malarial parasite, P. falciparum. There is one antibiotic called atovaquone. And it turns out that in a clinical study, if you give it to three patients, one of those patients will have spontaneous resistance due to a malarial parasite that had a mutation in it because you only have to change one amino acid. So resistance pops out up in about every 10 to the 12th cells. But if you have to change two, you have to get them both right. Resistance to chloroquine arises about in every billionth patient, about every one in 10 to the 20th cells. Now it turns out that malaria has 10 to the 20th cells occur every year, so it can uh, overcome this without too much trouble. It, it's breathing hard anyway, but for larger species like, you know, humans or elephants or fish or where the populations are much lower than 10 to the 20th, it would take many, many, many years uh, to develop a, um, a, a mutation of, of this complexity. Now this number 10 to the 20th is, is actually kind of interesting um, if you know how to do exponents. Um, it turns out that there have been, in the history of life on Earth, the past four billion years or so, there have been about 10 to the 40th cells, 10 to the 40th. You'll know that, notice that 10 to the 40th, the exponent is about twice that. So there's good reason to think if you needed, in the history of life, a mutation that was just twice as complex as the mutation that uh, malaria needed to overcome chloroquine, that would be beyond the capacity of life on Earth to generate by random mutation. And again, I'd like to emphasize that what I'm doing here is I'm not arguing that Darwinism cannot make complex functional systems. The data on malaria and the other examples are an observation that it does not. And in science, observation beats theory all the time. So uh, Professor Dawkins can, can speculate about what he thinks Darwinian processes could do, but in nature, 
Darwinian processes have not been shown to do anything uh, in particular. 